name is Francis Duran. My name is Francis Duran, and I will be your session facilitator today. I'm joined by Jackie Bing, who's going to be our technology host. Um, just a reminder, as you probably just heard, um, the session is being recorded. And for those who are interested in transcription, those will be available through the Zoom platform. Um, the way we're going to do uh, questions during the presentation, certainly if you have them in the chat, you can drop them there. Um, if you are wanting to actually unmute and interject a question while the presenters are speaking, they're fine with that. If you could just raise your hand just so that we can um, not interrupt the flow too much, but they're open to you unmuting yourselves. Um, and we also wanted to just let you know um, that before we begin, that the views, policies, and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of our presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA or HHS. So I want to give all the time to our presenters. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Kaya, who is going to get us started. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Francis, for the warm welcome. Um, thank you to the participants for joining us um, for for the Diversity Pathways for Maryland IECMH presentation. We're really excited to be here. Before we get started with the presentation, just want to um, briefly kind of just do some very quick introductions. I, again, am Kaya Swan, the co-director of the PEAK team at the University of Maryland. And then my colleague, Laura, will briefly introduce herself. Hi, I'm Laura Lotto with the PEAK team as well. I'm co-director. Nice to see all of you. Yes, thank you. And at the PEAK team, um, excuse me, at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, the PEAK team focuses on parenting and infant early childhood mental health needs, as well as supporting uh, throughout the state. We support the, the state um, IECMH providers, as well as the pyramid team throughout the state. Our team is comprised of experts within the early childhood, um, maternal and child health field, program development, research and evaluation, and we currently partner with a variety of different providers across the state, local agencies to support the growth of systems of care. In this role specifically, we, specifically, we do provide training, technical assistance and implementation support, support to our um, IECMH workforce and programs. <clears throat> Next slide. In the next 50 minutes or so, we will discuss the diversity pathways for Maryland IECMH uh, workforce project. The project, oh, excuse me. The project discusses, I had a screen pop up. The project discusses um, and focuses on Maryland's efforts to support and retain existing IECMH staff and to expand and diversify the, the workforce. We will also briefly discuss the efforts to support existing staff, which includes the creation of the universal onboarding series, the statewide uh, minimum salaries, the formation of the Black Affinity Group, and then we'll dive into some of the, the strategies for creating new pathways for IECMH staff. Next slide. So here's one thing I, I am going to read this uh, directly just to make sure that we are capturing it directly as it was uh, written. Almost universally, the demand of IECMH services exceeds the pool of consultants available. So increasing the number of mental health providers interested in specialized training to offer IECMH services is critical. It is, a, it is also important that the consultant pool is representative of the racial, ethnic, linguistic, and experiential diversity of the early childhood providers and children being served. As research has demonstrated, this is the key to positive and provider outcomes. And that was written by Oppenheim in 2002, 2022, excuse me. So this slide uh, just briefly outlines um, some of the research, the national research um, that has identified and has focused on increasing the attention and importance of having a racially and culturally diverse workforce. Much of IECMH workforce nationally are white women and the recruitment and retention of BIPOC staff is something that many programs struggle to achieve. 
And in this slide, we just wanted to note some of the national, national research related to this need and the benefits to our diversifying the IECMH workforce. Next slide. As a quick overview and just to outline the timeline, um, Maryland has had a long history in implementing IECMH dating back to 2006. In 2006, there was a couple of great people um, from the, our state's Behavioral Health Administration, University of Maryland, um, as well as MSDE, that cared about early childhood at the right time and that collectively funded a couple of initiatives around the state that launched our Maryland IECMH pilot project in 2006. The pilot project demonstrated good outcomes, which then led to the statewide expansion of IECMH in 2009. Since then, we've had a variety of increased funding commitments to include a recent expansion of two, uh, in 2002, 2024 with ARPA dollars. And our team at University of Maryland has always been a part of the IECMH funding throughout the course of the project, which supports our local programs with training and TA, collect and evaluate data, which helps to tell the story about the impact of this work across the state. Um, on this slide and depicted on the map is, um, it covers all of our statewide IECMH programs. We have programs across the state in all 24 jurisdictions. There are distinctly 10 actual funded programs, which covers the urban, suburban, and the rural communities across our state. The funded programs are housed within uh, local governments and or nonprofit organizations, and they employ approximately about 32 consultants statewide. So the Maryland's IECMH model um, supports the promotion of positive mental and behavioral health practices for young children to build the capacity of early care and education providers as well as family members. The services also support young children who have developmentally, social, emotional, and behavioral issues by providing referrals uh, and services for children, families, teachers, and caregivers. Um, we've embedded the uh, pyramid model within the services um, that are provided through IECMH. Our consultants equipped the caregivers uh, to facilitate children's healthy social and emotional development. They develop relationships with the adults and caregivers in the, in, in the child's lives to build that capacity to strengthen and support the healthy and social development of children. Through this support, early education providers gain the comfort, confidence in addressing challenging behaviors that arise. But more importantly, this work also aims to address implicit bias and racism that arises in response to behavioral needs, as well as deepen the family engagement. In Maryland, our uh, IECMH support services are designed to have an array of early childhood providers, including coaches, behavior specialists, and mental health consultants. Each of these uh, staff brings a unique perspective and body of knowledge to their work. Their services are uh, designed to support the positive development of children with the main goal of maintaining children in their community settings. We provide here in Maryland a tiered model of support, which recognizes the benefits provided by a multidisciplinary team, and, is, and it ensures that supports are universally available for all children. As depicted in this visual right here, we have three uh, models, three tiers of support, if you will. The first tier, the program classroom level, are provided by behavioral specialist ones, while tier two is providing more targeted support, and those are behavioral specialist twos. And then the third top tier are what we considered uh, mental health consultants, i.e. CMH consultants, and they provide intensive support for behavioral health needs. Each jurisdiction across Maryland may organize their tiered model differently. However, each jurisdiction must include all the tiered levels of support within their model.
So I'm sure many of you all are aware of Walter Gilliam's and Rosemary Allen's research on implicit bias. The work of consultation is intentionally a social justice and racial equity approach. We collectively here in Maryland together, as well as many of the individual teams um, across the state are working to grow our skills and to be more intentional about the systematic and racial inequities that exist within our field. In Maryland and nationally, I'm sure you all will agree, this is an ongoing conversation. And here in Maryland, we're focused on um, really intentionally thinking about how we build the skills of our consultants in our workforce to be more responsive in the moment to the concerns that arise in the classroom, the cases and the providers. And then also, which is depicted in our work here with the diversity workforce strategy, is really looking at how it's represented in our workforce. We do consider um, this as a very important pillar of our work. So in Maryland, our workforce is multidisciplinary, which I stated earlier, that includes staff that have early childhood background, education, as well as staff from the middle health field. Um, as noted in this, um, in this um, kind of slide, we, we noted that our, our consultants are primarily a female dominated workforce. <laughs> Below also has the, the racial back, background of our consultants, and it also shows you the racial background of Maryland. Um, we think it's very important to track the racial background of our consultants, and it helps us to guide the recruitment practices and support local programs and recruiting. Given the racial intent of IECMH, we are recruit, we are committed to recruiting and retaining a more racially diverse workforce. You'll note in this um, figure in this slide that um, our white consultants are overrepresented um, in relation to the racial background in Maryland. Um, and then also we outlined some of the workforce challenges that we have here. And I'll just kind of pause for a minute to see if Laura had anything else to add to this slide. I think you covered everything. What? I'm like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so next we are going to um, talk a little bit and share more about um, the strategies that we have um, employed to support our existing staff. We'll talk a little bit more about the universal onboarding process, the statewide salary minimum, and then the Black affinity groups. So Maryland's onboarding, um, onboarding series, this is the second time that we have um, provided this onboarding series to our consultants, um, and it's a statewide onboarding series. We recognize that consultants are blending the perspectives of many different disciplines, including early childhood development, infant mental health, behavioral strategies, family system theories, as well as components of implicit bias and anti-racism and many more, while also needing to understand the perspective and pedagogy of educators who we target. For this reason, we put together a comprehensive onboarding series for all consultants that are um, providing services in Maryland. And the topics range from, um, it's a mix, let me back up, it's a mix of asynchronous and live trainings um, that have a broad uh, variety of topics, including the background, foundational knowledge, understanding IECMH in this background, and then also learning the practical skills and various components of the work. And this just outlines the specific trainings that we had. As I said before, we did this um, last year, so this is our second year. And so this year when we launched it, we um, utilized a CQI lens and really took a lot of the feedback that we had, that we gained from the first year to help inform how we developed the onboarding series this year. And that resulted actually in a, uh, a few additional trainings that um, we wanted to provide to the consultants, which included um, the consultative stance led by uh, Khadijah Johnston, as well as the introduction to Maryland, really providing a history, um, specific information about the teams, and then also the Maryland model. 
And then we also focused on providing um, a training on the outcome monitoring system, which is for data tracking. And then we dove into the specific assessment tools that they'll be utilizing and implementation. And then we are rounding it out um, at the end with an integration, which is basically a comprehensive synthesis of all of the trainings um, that they've received over the course of three to four months. Good, okay. Um, and so as Kaya said, we, um, you know, last year we did a series of focus groups with participants. Um, and this is some of the feedback that we received last year. We're sort of in the middle of the series, onboarding series right now, and but we plan to do the same thing um, afterwards, um, as well as use the um, quantitative data that we uh, collect after each of the trainings. And so, I'm just gonna read these out loud. So um, one participant said, just hearing from different parts of the state, different people, you know, some people have been doing it for a few month, months and people doing it for a few month, a months and some people for doing it, doing it for almost a year. So that helped me to hear from different perspectives, not just locally. And then for me, uh, the best part of the training series was definitely the ASQ training, the ASQSC, and the DECA training, just because that was concrete information I needed to function for my job. So these are just some of the examples. And we also got feedback around, you know, needing to needing to like bring everything together at the end and thus like the addition of the integration training. Um I think the other thing that we have sort of that we are um, figuring out is the pacing of it. Um, that has been we pack all like if you saw this long list of trainings that's packed into like two and a half months. Um, and so some people like that and some people don't. And so we're trying to figure out that balance as well of what, you know, People who are taking this have been either, you know, some of them have been in the field for a long time um, and others are just joining. So trying to find something that works for everybody is, is definitely a challenge and something that we're figuring out. Um, so the other way that we are, um, we have been working to uh, support existing staff is around um, the statewide salary survey. And so, you know, one thing to note is that we meet regularly with the IECMHC staff and with leadership from um, the 10 different organizations on a regular basis. Um, and one of the challenges that was consistently coming up in the leadership meetings um, is that while they had enough funding um, in their budgets to increase pay for their IECMHC staff, they were not able to due to restrictions in their organizations. Um, so, for example, one small nonprofit was unable to raise the pay of her IECMHC uh, staff without also increasing the pay of um, staff funded through another, through a different grant. Um, another program housed in a university setting was unable to increase pay um, as well and had been repeatedly told by HR that they were already paying their staff well. Um, that's something that I've heard from a few programs Um and even programs who were on the lower end that, you know, folks in their organizations were saying, well, your staff are paid great, but um, they weren't able to recruit folks and certainly weren't able to retain them. Um, and then, you know, during these discussions, I think it's important to note that, like, you know, other programs were quiet during these discussions and did not express, like, urgency or concern around this issue. And we wanted to figure out what was going on and asked if everybody would be okay if we conducted a salary survey. Um, and so first we conducted an, anom an anonymous survey where leadership from each program reported current staff salaries, their years, years of experience and benefits information. And then the next part was we requested de-identified budgets from the funder, Maryland State Department of Education. Um, and then we categorized the staff um, in two categories, either the behavior support specialist one and two, which Kaya went over in the tiered um, section, or consultants. The, the main difference is that consultants are license eligible or licensed, um, but they all serve in similar functions. Um, and so I'm just going to share the results. So these are the results from this initial um, study. So um, on the left hand side is the behavioral support specialist one and two. So you'll, you'll see that their salaries are lower um, than the consultant salaries overall. Um, the data in red is from the de-identified budgets from the funder. 
Um, and that just to note, like that is what people projected that they would be spending um, on on salaries. So we don't know if that was actually what they were they were spending. And then the data in yellow is from the salary survey that we conducted. Um, so that was directly from the leadership. So there are some differences, but you can see they're pretty, pretty close. Um, and like, obviously there's limitations with both data sets, but we wanna be careful not to let sort of that perfection get in the way of making decisions and creating change. Um, and so what we did from here is like process is important. So we um, shared this data back with the program leadership to gather thoughts and determine next steps. Again, there was interest from a handful of programs and there were some programs who did not feel that they needed uh, support in raising salaries. And I'm guessing those were the ones who were on the higher end. Um, but we didn't want so, but we still wanted to support the ones who are on the lower end. So we held a few small group meetings and eventually met one on one with anybody who was interested to determine the next steps. Um, we had also already brought up to the funder that low salaries um, have been a barrier to recruiting and retaining staff. And so we knew, um, and he was open to helping support us in in figuring out sort of what the next steps would be. Um, and so what we determined with the help of our partners is that really um, this 45760, which is like the bottom quartile, is would be the minimum for, um, for IECMHC staff um, in Maryland. Now we wanted to also set a minimum for folks who are um, license eligible or um, are licensed at 55 based on this data. Um, but to start, we put it at 45,760. Um, and we worked with the programs to determine what that timeline would be so that they could realistically bring it up. But this allowed, and so we, um, the funder actually put this in as a requirement of the grant, um, a funding requirement. And so this is something that if they aren't currently at, they are working towards, um, which is really exciting. And then we're going to go back and figure out what, what are the next steps from this. So. The next, the third thing that we wanted to talk about was um, the Black Affinity Group, which began uh, meeting monthly and uh, starting in February of 2022. Um, so as part of our statewide work, we had been hosting monthly equity meetings open to everyone. Um, and after one of these meetings, um, two Black staff and leadership um, positions reached out to see if they could start a Black Affinity Group and if the PEAK team would support them in that. Um, and the reason that they should, they're, you know, there were things that they didn't feel comfortable openly sharing in the larger mixed race group. Um, you know, as a white woman, I'm an outsider of the group. Um, however, like this is something that I really wanted to support. And, um, you know, members, they got together and and um, these are this is sort of the purpose that they came up with, um, with the help of um, Dr. Eva Marie Shivers. Um, and, um, you know, we think that this is you know, the purpose is to provide a safe space in which those who identify as Black and African American can examine their own internalized oppression to avoid having others tokenize their experiences, and two, to present an opportunity to create an effective coalition for addressing ineffective policies and practices in larger multiracial groups. I will also say that, um, you know, they're not sharing out like what they discuss every month or who attends, that is very much um, is, is stuff that they track on their own, but they did request, they wanted to share some feedback with our team. And so they got together and that was something that as a group, they shared feedback, which I think is really important in creating change and figuring out, okay, where are we falling short and what do we need to do? So I think there, this group serves multi functions and I think, um, is really amazing and exciting. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I just wanted to take, we're, before we dive into the next set, um, section, which is around, um, increasing or creating, um, pathways for new staff to enter, um, the co consultation workforce in Maryland, we just wanted to take a minute to, for you to reflect and share, you know, via chat is, is perfectly fine. Um, you know, how are you supporting existing staff? Um, and it could be one of the three ways that we mentioned here. It could be something different. Um, 
you know, this is an opportunity for us all to learn from each other. So we're sort of sharing, here's what we're doing, but I am sure that there are really innovative things happening across the country. Um, so we'd love to hear from you as well. So I'm just going to give folks a minute to, um, to either, you can certainly raise your hand and share or um, via the chat. So we have um, Chris Ann um, in the chat. She says that they're doing a universal onboarding process. Okay. Okay, great. So in, that looks like in Nevada and Michigan. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see what the differences are and sort of um, compare notes of like what has worked and what hasn't. Um, if folks are willing to do that at some point. That'd be great. Anything else folks wanted to share? I know I'm way too good at staying silent. So I'll uh, right. I'm, I'm, I'll stay with uncomfortable silence for a while. Um, oh, wait, now oh, stuff is coming. One. We got some more. Okay. Um, okay. So Kevin O'Brien says they're working on universal onboarding processes that focus as much as competency assessments and training, so on outputs and inputs. And then in Colorado, they're also doing a universal onboarding um, awesome. process. That's really love exciting. to hear that, if nothing else, just to see what other people are doing and, um, you know, to, to hear from others. Oh, Alaska is doing it well doing it as well. And I think, you know, onboarding is one thing is the training, but then also supporting them once they start taking cases, like how people are, you know, bringing them into the field of um, actually holding cases. So I think in Maryland, that's probably something we'd love to talk more about as well. Yeah. And I'm going to jump on to the next section, but as, like, if you also, if there's a, of the three um, methods mentioned, if folks are interested in um, digging deeper in one of these, like I'm just thinking a lot of, it sounds like a lot of people are doing the um, universal onboarding, but has anybody else um, looked into like statewide salary minimums or, you know, increasing wages for consultants in some other way or um, supporting um, black staff or other um, BIPOC staff um, is another thing just to consider if you are already doing um, what would be the next step? Um, and I will go ahead to the next slide. Okay. Um, and so um, the next two things that I'm going to share are going to be around um, creating pathways for new staff. So one is around um, building uh, partnerships around internship placements uh, with MSW programs. And the next one is around um, expansion of qualifications and what it, what it means to be qualified. Um, so the um, in terms of building the internship partnerships, you know, as of, you know, a few years ago, there was only really one program that was consistently using interns to, um, to help serve their their um, serve serve their um, childcare programs in their area, um, and what we did with um, the help of her, as well as some other programs who had had interns, was we um, developed um, you know guidelines for what would be helpful in terms of um, these internship partnerships, and we created relationships with um, a few university MSW programs. Um, to establish, you know, paid um, internships, you know, and and as part of that, they get to participate in the onboarding series. Um, we have uh, periodic um, periodic uh, times for them to meet and sort of join together and see what's working, what are what's one person learning versus, you know, in in one of the sites um, versus another. To date, I think they are housed at 
is it three or four different um, organizations? Um, and one is a, a macro student as well. So is spending one day out in the field um, at one of the programs. Um, and then the other day in the office with us, um, working on some more um, macro, uh, uh, you know, materials. Um, and I think anything else, Kaya? I feel like Kaya has been really spearheading this effort so I think part of it was just like aligning the onboarding series and timing of that knowing that in the fall that's when you know we would get new interns so we wanted to be sure to have the onboarding series aligned with the timing that they would start so that they would be able to increase their knowledge and capacity around um, consultation at the same time as starting their internship Um, we'd love to talk more about this you know, whole internship program probably next year at the conference because we would have had a year under our belt, but we are currently, what, three, four months into the internship program. Uh, but it's, it's going well. We have a diverse pool of interns um, and they're very eager uh, to learn. And our hope is that, you know, this will wet their palate, if you will, for the field and for IECMH and potentially grow the workforce later and that they would come back as an MSW um, graduate and actually enter into the workforce. So that's like the background of the strategy. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, no, and I think the other thing that um, you made me think about is just that we also, um, it's it's very clear it takes a lot of time on the supervisors and the programs um, side to host an intern. And so it's not until really the winter or spring that they're actually able to work independently. And so, you know, we recognize that this is this is something that another way that they're contributing and not necessarily a way that they're going to be able to increase caseloads or anything like that. And if we had any sort of expectations around that, um, you know, that would not work out so well for anyone. So just another thing to keep in mind. Um, The next thing is around um, expansion of qualification. So when Kaya was going over sort of our tiered model, um, we have a multidisciplinary workforce, so people of all different backgrounds. But, you know, what is in our current standards is that folks have to have a bachelor's at, at a minimum. Um, But what we were hearing is that um, there are several programs that came across um, people who had an AA degree and had been working in childcare for many, many years and have a a, know their community really well. Um, And so we also wanted to expand that as well. Um, And so just our working theory um, that we have like the multidisciplinary workforce, and we really have come to embrace as a strength, um, given the many areas of expertise needed for the role, um, not all of which are accomplished via a mental health degree or license. We really think it is a strength of our state having folks with all different backgrounds um, and um, education levels. and our state has long supported both pyramid model and consultation um, and view the pyramid model as a scaffold for those consultants coming up in the work. Um, and let me go to the next one. And a couple of benefits of the multidisciplinary workforce are that funds do not always allow for a fully licensed workforce. Um, licensed providers can bring uh, mental health expertise. So we ha- do have, um, most programs have at least one person who is a mental health, um, a licensed mental health provider or license eligible. Um, and then also requiring licensure can be a barrier to creating an inclusive and diverse workforce. And also the non-licensed providers um, and folks um, with AA degrees often bring early childhood education um, and care knowledge and ex- experience. And that is something that, um, really adds so much to, to um, you know, their their ability to provide services in the childcare um, setting. Um, and so, you know, knowing that nobody comes in with everything, um, all of the skills, all of the knowledge, um, and I know there's a whole 
really exciting crosswalk um, that just came out by the COE that um, Kaya and I are really, really excited about. This was like our attempt uh, maybe six months or nine months ago to kind of start to think about what are the various components um, that a person needs to have. And um, in order to be a good, like a strong uh, mental health consultant and, um, you know, whether or not they're coming in with that as a strength or something that they would need support with. And just also recognizing that there are many ways to um, learn these skills. So whether it's, you know, somebody is on, you know, on the job or experienced in the community, um, we value that uh, as much as, um, you know, going for a, an advanced degree or um, bachelor's or master's. I do think, so we are piloting this in one um, one county. I I do think that this, um, along with just sort of the, the slides before around salary, one thing that is in my head is around um, that, you know, when we're looking at what does it mean to be qualified, do we really think that folks with a master's degree should be paid significantly more than those with a bachelor's who are doing pretty much the same role. I think that is something that um, we really need to grapple with. And, and, um, and, you know, it doesn't make sense to me that somebody would have to go back for their master's if they're already doing their job and doing it well in order to get a pay raise. Um, it seems like there should be other pathways for increased um, funding. So that's just something that is in my head and I'm not sure, you know, quite what to do with that, but it's thank something that we are talking that. about. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that in the in the chat, Francis. What we love so I think where where we are at right now is really looking at our workforce from a competency base. Like what are the core competencies that, you know, we think someone in the field should have and identifying those competencies and then looking within our structure, within our system to figure out how someone is able to achieve and gain those competencies through non-traditional ways that may not be a bachelor's or a master's program, but is it, you know, walking and living, living knowledge, you know, that they've gained through working in the field that would help to build it. And so we, um, you know, are working in our state to really try to um, dig deeper in that and, and look for what some of the key competencies are for our consultants and how we can support them in getting them. Thanks, Laura. No, thank you. Um, ooh, I like this. Competency-based pay is a brilliant strategy. Reinforcing the privilege of going to graduate school with automatically higher pay isn't going to create a better system. Exactly. That is a... I will, we will be using that. So how, I mean, how do you, what do you do with that? So how do we undo some of that and change? Um, I guess you were answering it, competency-based pay. Um, right. <laughs> something we will be looking into. We'd love to hear from others. Thank you so much for that, Lily. That was amazing. I think you just really captured what we were saying in a much more brilliant way than we were able to articulate it. But I think what since we're on the path of doing this, we would love to hear from others on the on this webinar to see like what are some of the strategies you all are using to create pathways for new IECMH staff. We used a few um, when we talked about the internship pathways and expansion of qualifications, but what are others doing? Internships. Are those MSW internships, Jen? Thank you so much for placing that in in the chat. Would you mind either writing more about that or maybe coming off mute to? Sure. Um, they're mental health disciplines, kind of overarching. Um, so one of the people that I happen to have this year is um, school psych. Someone else is MSW. So they kind of are across different mental health programs um, in our area. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Yeah, ours has been primarily MSW 
we our next step is expanding to different universities but i'm like there's got to be another strategy that we're not thinking of or articulating i think the other thing is also embedding um iecmh classes and content within programs like msw or bachelor's programs so that you know graduates are gaining some of that knowledge but that's still primarily focused on um you know individuals with graduate degrees and so thinking of other opportunities, I think is always helpful. And then we have another one in the chat, tearing, scaffolding, positions based upon training and experience. What does that look like? If you're willing to share. <clears throat> yeah, so um, we're, it's working because we have a new program that <clears throat> sort of pulling different job descriptions from different parts of the organization. But so knowing that not everybody has comes license eligible, having a job description for someone who's, you know, it's a bachelor's degree, master's, but that. We're cutting out a little bit. Okay, Kevin, I definitely want to hear about this, but it sounds like it, I think we're cutting out a little bit. Um, but definitely would love to learn more. Um, any other, or any other questions about, um, about any of the things that we've shared today? While we're giving folks a minute to um, post any question in the chat, or certainly you can, you know, you're invited to come off of mute. I, just going back to some of the original things that you were saying around how I love that slide that you had that sort of showed the demographic breakdown, racial breakdown in Maryland, and overlaid that with your um, consultant pool. And then you were saying how you kind of check in periodically, right, to kind of see how that looks, and and also how that can inform your recruiting efforts. And I was just curious what that process looks like, like what data sources are you like, or is that kind of integrated into your hiring or how, how are you getting the data? And then how are you, you know, applying your learnings really? I mean, it's tough. So there's 10 different programs across the state. So everybody, you know, this is something that we're bringing up during, you know, our statewide meetings, but it's really up to the individual programs, you know, how they're recruiting folks. Um, we are sharing different resources and and this is something that we're tracking at a state level but you know some of the programs have one staff member and so if that staff member is white and has been there for 20 years like you know they have and and so like we're focusing on a, then supporting them in um in you know how how do they talk about equity and recognize bias when it comes up um but you know, it, it's just something that we're tracking sort of statewide and 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 going to be paying attention to. But I don't think we have a specific specific process um, since you know our pool of um, consultants is kind of relatively small. Yeah, and just looks to build on that, you know, we within our outcomes management system, monitoring system, our database. The consultants will, when they register, they have to identify um, or ask to identify their racial background. So that's part of where we pull the data from. And, you know, using the data to inform is just always communicating it back to them, you know, because most programs know their, their program, they know their staff, they know, you know, who they're hiring, but to see it from more of a statewide view, so give that information back to them so that they're actually getting it in real time to understand, um, you know, what, what our full workforce looks like. And then having real intentional conversations about the importance of, you know, the racial background of our consultants and how do we match them with the communities in which they're serving and the value of that. So, you know, sharing that information with them consistently, I think just helps, you know, inform them, but then also having those statewide conversations. But it's not like a specific process as much as it's just organically occurring. Thank you. You're welcome. It looks like Lily posted another comment in the chat, and I don't know if 
you guys want to yeah she was just saying like this example is specific to IECMH but the practice-based Florida ethic coaching programs part C established established a structure for evaluating model fidelity and, and effective practice before she left and they talked about ways to compensate those who established practice mastery yeah they established and maintained practice mastery Thank you for sharing that, Lily. I wonder if it, that was like a scale up, like if you, I don't know what that looks like in practice. Yeah. I can describe it if you'd like. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> okay, so um, we worked with the Anita Zucker Center out of the University of Florida. Um, uh, to, as our implementation team. Um, and again, this is under IDA Part C funding. Um, and we established a professional development system, which we called FLEPIC, which was um, teaching our early interventionists to do practice-based coaching for parents and caregivers so that the parents and caregivers were providing the developmental interventions rather than solely the interventionist. Um, and um, so we, we underwent a process of establishing a model for the um, coaching and supervision of those interventionists as they learned these practices. And there was a, um, a checklist and um, video recording process for recording home visits and demonstrating the different required skills that they were exhibited in the home visits. Um, and at first it was during the kind of initial six month training period for each um, provider, but then we were starting um, to, we were just reaching the end of initial implementation when I when I left the state, um, but they were working on establishing an ongoing process for continual evaluation of the maintenance of those skills and demonstrating whether or not this was a person who was practicing this these um, this methodology at fidelity, and we were talking about how could we utilize that to enhance the compensation for these providers. Got it. Got it. No, that's great. And, and that was necessarily an interdisciplinary um, and and uh, pro professional and paraprofessional workforce. Mm -hmm. No, and that's a great, like, that's one of the things that we've talked about, like, if we were to make our onboarding series end with, like, a, some sort of certification, if that could be partially used to um as as uh rationale for increased compensation but we're figuring that all out too but thank you for sharing that lily um and then jen okay so kaya you responded to jen's question or comment uh, yeah hopefully i covered it but um the thought is that each program has a licensed staff and or a licensed eligible staff within their program. So it may not be all the consultants, but there's at least one on staff that can help triage and support the other consultants that are unlicensed. And then also reflective supervision um, is another key component to processing and reflecting on um, their experiences. Um, and so the hope is that they are getting the support from their colleagues and or program managers within the local programs to um, offer supports to, to diverse families. I do recognize exactly what you're saying. Families are struggling and um, it's important for each of our programs to have diverse referral sources to address not only the child's needs and or the provider's needs, because oftentimes providers coming with some needed supports, but also the family. And so we're, you know, servicing all of the people involved in, in that child's life um, beyond just um, the providers. So hopefully I answered that question. Oh, great. 
No, and I also wanted to just say like, you know, if if somebody who's licensed can't get into a center, then we're never going to find out about those issues. So I think also, you know, sometimes, especially with family child care provider um, uh, places, um, you know, they may be more likely to to open their doors to somebody with who has been with an AA who's been um, has a lot of experience teaching and can can provide some assist- assistance as well. Um, so I think that's just you know, who are we missing um, if we only um, rely on licensed mental health uh, mm-hmm. folks? All right. Well, I know we're at time. Time. That's what I was going to say, Kai. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut you off, though. Did you have something else you wanted to say? Nope. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to thank everyone for being here. And of course, I want to thank Laura and Kaya for their wonderful presentation. I think we're going to have to hold you to coming back next year so you can tell us a little bit more about the internship right after you've had a full year under um, under your feet. But anyway, so appreciate the information that you're sharing and the good questions that were coming on in the chat. Um, we hope everyone has had a great time at the conference and certainly at this workshop. And we look forward to figuring this all out together and supporting one another in this work that we do around mental health consultation. So thanks everybody. Take care. Oh, thank you. Thank you.